After being cut to pieces, battered, pillaged, and teetering on the brink of annihilation for centuries after their collapse, it's actually not too shocking that the Romans would rise once more nearly a thousand years later, this time not united under the banner of Latin, but through their competitive and unbelievably ambitious descendants, whose centuries-long rivalries with one another and lust for power and glory would drive them to aim for conquering not just the Mediterranean this time, but nearly the entire world. I am of course referring to the major Latin nations of Western Europe, Italy, France, Spain, and Portugal, four countries with radically different but also remarkably familiar histories. Despite helping kick off the age of exploration that set the stage for the development of our modern world, starting with Marco Polo and other Italian explorers, the Italians are one of the only Western European powers who did not establish a colonial presence or any significant communities in Asia, although the occasional monk or missionary would sporadically settle there. No, instead it was the runt of the litter, a rather small, backwards, and seemingly insignificant nation formerly known as Lusitania during the Roman days. By the 15th century, the Portuguese, Castilians, and Catalonians were largely successful in reclaiming the Iberian Peninsula, but Portugal was still relegated to the vulnerable fringes of the European continent, suffering constant attacks by other Europeans and devastating slave raids by North Africans. It's possible that these were the only conditions that could have led the Portuguese to push farther than their peers at the time could have ever imagined. As it turns out, their curse of geography was actually a blessing, placing them in the perfect spot to venture south past the Maghreb and into southwest Africa, possibly becoming the first Europeans in the region in nearly a thousand years. After establishing bases of operation there, instead of stopping, their curiosity drove them to keep going until in 1487, five years before Columbus, they stumbled upon an area and people never before seen by the Western world, that being the Khoisan lands of Southern Africa around the Cape of Good Hope. Driven by an entrepreneurial and exploratory spirit, soon after, the Portuguese would finally reach their long desired target, India in the Oriental world, a region whose valuable commodities had been cut off from Europe for centuries. In an age where you can fly across the planet in 24 hours, their achievement may not seem so impressive, but in the world of the 1400s, this was an unparalleled achievement, and back in Europe, the Portuguese wished to keep all the spoils of this endeavor, which were massive, to themselves, and for nearly a century, they did. Despite having less than a million inhabitants, Portugal became one of the most, possibly the most powerful nation in the world, frequently warring with multiple nations simultaneously, both at home and abroad. Their military tactics and prowess became so fine-tuned, they were often able to win battles drastically outnumbered over 100 men to one. They had an almost mythical status in South Asia and the Far East at the time. Their technology, skills, knowledge, and experience allowed them to cross the seas and decimate enemy forces seemingly with ease. Soon, many people of Asia were just as interested with trading and allying with the Portuguese as the Portuguese were with them, allowing the sharing of philosophies, commodities, and scientific innovations unique to both sides of Eurasia. During their spread across Asia in the Indian Ocean, the Portuguese established dozens of outposts across the Indo-Pacific, giving rise to small local Catholic Lusophone communities in far-flung coastal regions from the Persian Gulf to Japan, effectively granting them control over the Indian Ocean and most of the South China Sea. How did they do it? The general rule of thumb was to always vie for the underdog against the dominant power in the region to ensure the decline of the regional hegemon and the loyalty of its former subordinates. So in the case of India, they would support various local Hindu states against the Mamluks and Islamic sultanates. In Sri Lanka, they initially threw their weight behind the Sinhalese kingdom of Kate in the south and their fight against the Tamil Jaffna kingdom in the north before the Portuguese were eventually powerful enough to dominate both of them. And in Southeast Asia, they gained the assistance and admiration of many of the local Chinese and Hindu communities by overthrowing their former Malaccan ruler which they were able to do by taking advantage of hostilities between the Malays, Achenese, and others. 
but their enemy one day might become their ally the next, or vice versa, as was the case for the kingdoms of Siam and Burma, who, although originally supportive of Portugal's role in the dissolution of the Malay Sultanates that had dominated trade in the region for centuries, they soon found themselves perturbed by an even bolder and pushy Portuguese fleet, and occasionally had to assert their boundaries against them. The Portuguese were initially well received in much of the region due to their skills in diplomacy and their willingness to learn and respect the local customs of the region. However, this pragmatic and cutthroat practice of duplicity, along with their increasingly aggressive and authoritarian behavior, lost Portugal much of the goodwill and respect they had gained there. Through trade and reverse engineering, over time many Asian nations were able to reproduce their achievements, greatly diminishing Portugal's militaristic advantages and their expansionist ambitions soon came to an end when other, newer, shinier European powers like the Dutch, French, and British beat the Portuguese at their own imperialist game dislodging them from their throne as the kings of the East and West. Thus, Portugal, after nearly a century of dominating almost the entirety of all 70 million square kilometers of the Indian Ocean, was subsequently relegated to small, scattered pockets, such as Macau, Goa, and two small enclaves known as Daman and Diu by the 17th century. Roman Catholic monks had arrived in these regions and began seeking converts very soon after the arrival of the Portuguese and were met with great success in some cases, but it soon became clear that the Portuguese crown wished to dominate these territories, not only politically and economically, but culturally. They became increasingly paranoid and intolerant of all non-Catholic religions, expelling from Goa tens of thousands of Hindus, Muslims, Protestants, and even some local Catholics that were accused of not being Catholic enough, which left Portuguese India with an overwhelmingly Catholic population, and this is the group you might know as Goan Catholics today. By the 20th century, an increasingly desperate and authoritarian Portuguese government under the Salazar dictatorship took even more drastic measures to hold on to their overseas territorial possessions, including violently suppressing independent activists, greatly damaging their reputation in the region, and counterproductively fueling dissent even more. Portugal was the last European power with colonies in Asia, stubbornly holding on until the newly created Republic of India took Goa, Daman, and Diu by force in 1961. East Timor gained independence in 1974 after decades of widespread protests and the fall of Portugal's dictatorship. And finally, Macau was transferred to the People's Republic of China only in 1999 one of the few smooth, bloodless, and uncontested transfers of territory by Portugal. The unmixed Portuguese in the Asian territories at the time of independence was tiny, only a few hundred in Goa and Timor each, virtually all of whom left after independence, and maybe a couple thousand in Macau. However, many of the mixed population stayed, despite being offered Portuguese citizenship, and they have faced varying challenges such as acceptance, discrimination, and assimilation with the locals. The unmixed European population in their Asian colonies was always quite small. In 1950, less than 500 whites were recorded as living in Portuguese India, despite efforts made by the crown to create a permanent ethnic Portuguese community there by importing Portuguese brides for soldiers stationed in the territories. In South Asia, initial converts to Roman Catholicism from across many different cultural and ethno-linguistic groups largely adopted Portuguese surnames, ostensibly to prevent discrimination and infighting based on their traditional caste, but also as a means of assimilation by consolidating them into a single homogenized group. Although they mostly retained their original languages despite the insistence by Portugal to speak Portuguese, and the various Portuguese dialects gradually evolved into unique Creole languages with heavy influence from surrounding tongues. Hence, this is a bit confusing, even to the British who originally referred to these groups as Portuguese Indians because of their Portuguese names, Catholic faiths, and their Portuguese customs. And although there are several million South Asians with an Iberian surname today, only a small minority actually have any significant Portuguese ancestry whatsoever. The death rate, emigration rate, and intermarriage rate of Portuguese settlers was too high to sustain a significant European population in these regions. And unlike in colonial Brazil, the region was just too tumultuous for Portuguese families to thrive and European women were exceedingly rare until the 20th century. There are a multitude of Konkani, Bengali, Malayalam, Tamil, and Sinhalese-speaking Catholics 
influenced by Portuguese culture, and they are distinct from the multiracial Luso-Indian populations known as Indian mestizos during the colonial era. Historically, they had largely intermarried and blended in with other European arrivals or separate Eurasian groups, such as the Sri Lankan Burgers and Anglo-Indians, sustaining the communities scattered across the country. The Anglo-Indian's name is partially a misnomer, as it includes all individuals of partial European ancestry in India, including Irish, Scottish, French, Dutch, German, and Scandinavian, but those with Portuguese origin are probably the largest, and only a few thousand still speak Portuguese or a mixed Portuguese Creole language. In the present day, most Goan and Mangalorean Catholics deny ancestral association with the Portuguese, and indeed, genetic studies have found that their levels of European admixture are usually quite low, although they were found to have significant Sephardic Jewish ancestry, since a significant number of Portuguese crypto-Jews were known to have fled to their overseas colonies and blended into the local population during the Inquisition. These various Luso-Asian groups were extremely mobile and fluid, with Portugal's extensive Indo-Pacific trade networks leading to intermixing between Macau, Goa, Malacca, Timor, Brazil, and even beyond. After the British took the reins from Portugal, the Goan and Mangalorean Catholics were heavily employed and involved with British authorities, leading many to migrate to Britain's East African colonies across the Indian Ocean, mainly Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda, although the anti-Asian violence and discrimination of the post-colonial area saw these nations nearly disappear overnight. The centuries-old Iberian-Eurasian communities that remain in South, East, and Southeast Asia are now increasingly intermixing with the locals and other ethnic groups, diluting their heritage and culture, but also expanding it. In some areas, such as the Philippines, they are largely well-received and accepted by virtually the entire population, while in other areas they continue to face persecution. Estimating their numbers in the present day is extremely difficult, as most Eurasians have intermixed and assimilated with the locals to various degrees, and hence it is more of a spectrum of European admixture rather than definitive groupings, but there are a few key indicators that we can use as a proxy. After independence, the vast majority of the Eurasian Dutch Indos that remained in Indonesia were forced to change their names to an Indonesian one, similar to Chinese Indonesians. Although, for whatever reason, the Portuguese Indonesians were allowed to keep theirs. And so today, we can see there are tens of thousands, maybe even a hundred thousand descendants in Indonesia with an Iberian surname, mostly concentrated in the east in the Maluku and East Nusa Tenggara Islands. Out of the 1.5 million South Asian Christians living in the Gulf Arab states, the majority are St. Thomas Christians from Kerala, but many tens of thousands are Goans, Mangalorians, or East Indian Catholics, and in addition, there are at least 2 million Catholic Filipinos and other Asians in the region. The memory and legacy of the Portuguese and Spanish empires throughout Asia in the present is largely mixed, with many groups unable to look past some of the historical atrocities done to their ancestors. However, in recent years, a new, democratic, and friendlier Portugal has begun to re-establish ties with the East, with more Portuguese migrants living in Asia now than ever did during the colonial period, and many Indians, Chinese, and Southeast Asians are re-evaluating their views on Portugal and the small but very influential Luso-Asian communities around them. In South Asia, there are at least tens of thousands of individuals of partial Portuguese descent, and well over a million other Indian, Sri Lankan, and Bangladeshi Catholics with a Portuguese name, making them by far the largest Luso-Asian community in the world in the present. Southeast Asia has hundreds of thousands of Portuguese descendants, including the Kristang of Malaysia and other centuries-old Luso-Asians in Myanmar, Thailand, Indonesia, East Timor, and the Philippines. And in East Asia, there is a smaller community of Macanese and other Luso-Asians, although the vast majority of Portuguese speakers in Asia today are actually Brazilian migrants of Japanese ancestry, known in Japan as Nikai Brazilians, who returned to Japan well after the colonial 
colonial period. But many have lived in Brazil for so long that the majority still speak Portuguese as their native language and are heavily influenced by Lusophone culture. Although it's unsure whether they would be considered Luso-Asians or not, since their history differs significantly from these other groups. A massive proportion of Luso-Asians, around a quarter to half of the entire community, has departed from their traditional homes in Asia, with the bulk of Luso-Asians and East African Portuguese Indians making a new home for themselves in either Portugal itself, the Persian Gulf, the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the USA, and across Europe, Latin America, and many other regions of the world leading to even further intermixing and cultural exchange with many different groups, making them an extremely unique and fascinating community. Paradoxically, despite the violent and despotic nature of Portugal's late-stage colonialism, the country has possibly the best relationship with their former overseas territories, now independent nations, out of any major European power. Portugal has also repaired relations with some of their African colonies as well, and it's likely the significant intermixing and cultural exchange has helped to bridge the gap between these groups of otherwise very different Portuguese-speaking nations. They're getting along a whole lot better than France is, at the very least. In my opinion, without this tiny little slice of Europe called Portugal, our world would simply not be the same today. So please let me know your thoughts on these various Luso-Asian groups and their history in Asia and around the world. Thank you all so much for watching. This has been Mason. I'll see you next time.